Yo, people, we're live. We are back. It's the same old Arsenal podcast. Another very, very special episode for you tonight. I'm your host, Dan Potts. And I've got none other than Mr. Clive Palmer from the Arsenal Vision podcast. Apologies are a little bit late. Clive is a very busy man. And of course, the Arsenal Vision podcast run over. Uh, but he is with us now. Clive, how are you, mate? I'm fine. And thanks for asking me. And sorry I took so long to get here, right? But uh, <laughs> hopefully your listeners will think it's worth it. <laughs> Well, I certainly will, and I'm sure that everybody is enjoying uh, what is going to be a great show. We're going to get right into things because I know there's a lot of people that are really excited to hear your views on things. Um, But it's been a strange season, Clive. Um, What I want to do is kind of talk about moving forward from what has been a pretty poor season. But just for a few minutes, just want to give a bit of an update on where you are with things as we come to a close with where Arsenal are, and that can be anything from the ownership and the board right the way through to the manager and the players. And I know it's quite a broad question, but in a nutshell, it's quite easy for me to see where things are wrong. And I know that I share the same opinions with yourself. So where, how are you, how are you, how are you feeling thoughts coming into the close of this season, mate? Well, you know, I look at, I look at things slightly differently. I, I think it's not hard as fans to say when something's wrong. I, I honestly, I don't think it is. If we're sitting there as a group of fans and and we're playing Villarreal away and we're seeing Smith Rowe playing false nine, you ain't got to be Pep Guardiola to think maybe that's not working. Do you know what I mean? When you're watching Danny Sabias running through quicksand on the, in in Villarreal, maybe you're thinking to yourself, could we have played somebody else in midfield? Maybe one of our midfielders who's playing left back. You know, this this stuff isn't hard. You know, I think sometimes we get up our own backsides about this sort of analysis and. But, you know, there are some things which are fun to do, right? You know, statistical stuff, really looking ahead, looking at the horizon, where we are, looking at player development. I find that stuff really interesting. So when you look back on the year, you can get angry about those individual moments that are not being great. Or you can say, so hold on a minute, let's look at this last year of our lives. I don't know about you, Dan, but the last year of my life <laughs> has been completely turned upside down, right? So, oh, yeah. Uh, and it's the same for the players that they're watching. So... I'm looking at this year with no, I've calmed down from Villarreal, even though watching Manchester United blow it last night makes didn't make it any better. Now I've calmed down for some of the things that we could we all know that weren't quite right. What has this year been about? For me, it's been about development and preparing the ground for renewal. So development of some of our younger players has been significant. We will see that even more so in the next year. Development of our young manager who's inexperienced, made some mistakes. I'm hoping we'll see that next year. If we don't, we don't. That's that's football. Coaches shouldn't be the most important people in the club. But I'm afraid he's too important in our club. The reason why, we've got ownership issues. For me, director of football issues. Um, We haven't got enough experience around the club. So the coach is really important. So he carries all our dreams, hence we focus on him. And I, I also think, you know, Development has been a key issue. But I also think with Arteta, the one thing I, I want him to do is to manage upward in this club with our ownership. We all know our ownership is not great. We all know they're absent. We all know things have happened at the club that wouldn't happen if they were on board every single week. I don't think they would happen, particularly some of the, the deals from the agents are having fun at our expense. Um, I would like to see a lot more um, oversight of those type of issues, shall we say. But I will say it's been a development year for the club. But the next step is what we do now. We've cleared out some of the rubbish in January. We're preparing the ground to clear out some different people going forward in a year when everyone wants to move on 10 players. So we have to be really sharp. And then how we rebuild and renew the squad, it is massively key because... Next year, we we are literally, what I'm looking for is a no-excuse environment where we can really judge people because it's a normal year, fans are in the ground, we're all in the pub, we're all watching the game where we want to watch it. 
players are happy. They're, everyone's moving around socially. We have a squad that we all can recognise. The majors had a chance to learn. The players have had a chance to understand the goals of the manager. No excuses. We haven't got Europe. No excuses. And that's when I think that people who are quite hard on the current regime can really get stuck in because there is no excuses. You see what I mean? Mm. If we do things right. And I think that's where I am. Development year. I say it now, but I won't say that five minutes after Bill Royale. Do you know what I mean? So I'm being honest with you. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I feel. No, and I like your honesty, Clive. And why I appreciate and I listen to you on Arsenal Vision is your patience and your kind of taking a step back. I, I have so much admiration for how many times you can watch a football game, I must admit, because there's plenty of games <laughs> this season that I would not want to watch again, trust me. So I do have admiration for that. But I think I am probably one of those play, uh, those fans sorry, that do have been frustrated throughout the most of this yeah. season. I have been very negative at times. Um, I've been frustrated and this process that people are telling me to trust, I've been trusting and been patient with for 16 years now and I'm not seeing anything moving forward. From last season, I haven't really seen much progression, uh, certainly not within the league. Um, I was really frustrated after Villarreal because of the frustration with Arteta for experimenting in what I thought was one of the most important games of the season in the first leg against Villarreal by anchoring Thomas Partey on his own, by playing a false nine, by you know using Chaka as left back and wondering why um, he was getting done in the first four minutes. That kind of stuff really frustrated me with the manager and it kind of epitomised what I was saying throughout the whole year. I was really praying this manager would turn things around, prove me wrong. But I was seeing stuff that I was really worried about quite early on around October, November, and I was hoping he would learn quickly. And towards the end, it kind of got frustrating because it felt like he'd learned too late, particularly with the team selection. I'm a huge fan of Pepe and I've been calling out to be, play, to be playing a lot more than he has been. I think he's mismanaged him quite a lot. He was playing Willie Ann a hell of a lot and was expecting something from Willie Ann that he wasn't showing him. And I'm not quite sure what that was. Then I saw the situation with Smith Rowe, who had blossomed into a player that perhaps we were needing uh, at the start of the season. And I started to see some of the mismanagement of previous players, him now saying, what am I going to now do with Martinelli? What am I going to do now with Pepe? And I was just getting so frustrated with it because I was starting to see things that I was calling out for months previously. So could you give me any kind of positive with why Arteta should be given the time? What have you seen, Clive, this kind of gone season that, OK, yeah, he's got some things wrong. And I've pointed those out quite clearly, but I think everyone can see that. What are the things that he's got right that you think, do you know what? I can see something with this manager that makes gives me some some kind of hope going into next season. So it's um it's an interesting one. I tend to okay, I'm a bit strange now. I tend to <laughs> I try not to I try to look at the football. Right? I try to look at the football this season, I try to look at the, the tactical side of things. I try to stay away from focusing all of my thoughts on the one guy that's sitting staying on the sideline. You know, I try to, because if you do, you're not really seeing everything. Do you know what I mean? You're only seeing, you're looking for conclusions for the opinions that you have. And and I I like to say, I always say, like, you know what, Arteta's fine, um, but he makes mistakes. Um, Emery was fine. He made mistakes. Yeah? Finger was fine. He makes mistakes. We could do this again. We could do this forever. Do you know what I mean? And so <laughs> it's going to happen. We're never going to agree with substitution time. We're never going to agree with the selection. We know, we get, but if we're winning, we're going to agree with everything. Do you, do you see what I mean? And so, That's a good point. Um, my, my view on it is slightly different. I try to be a bit more holistic about it. And so let's just take some of the things that... Just think where we were back in September. Shall I tell you where we were back in September, October? I'll tell you what we were doing. We were we were playing 3-4-3. Three, three. It was working until it didn't. And everybody was screaming for Meza Ozil. Remember those days? Mm-hmm. No number 10. What, did you? When, how, how's your timeline looking now, Meta as over the last three months? Anyone say anything? No? Is it gone? <laughs> Is it gone? You know, we found this kid called Smith Rowe, right? Who, by the way, I didn't see many people predicting he would be so good in, in, in August. He had a shoulder injury till almost Christmas. The first time he was fit, he came into a Chelsea game. I'm thinking, what's what's he doing now? That's what I was thinking. Now, when he started to play and we... And, we moved Saka over to the right and we separated him and Tierney. Thomas Partey got fit in January because a big another big mistake was Thomas Partey playing at Spurs. Huge mistake. If he's fit, we don't have that terrible run before Christmas, in my opinion. Uh, he comes back in January. You introduce me through. You move Saka to the other side. You get Shaq and Partey partnership going together. 
Dave Louise on the right hand side, Gabriel on the left hand side of the defense. Callum Chambers comes in for Hector Bellerin. Hold on a minute. We start to get some results. Do you see what I mean? I didn't see that coming. So that gives me a little bit of hope. We were derailed by injuries again. Losing Louise, losing Lacazette, international break, losing Odegaard, losing Tierney, and then a Young popping off and getting malaria. You're thinking, Crikey, now this is this is the bit where I have a concern. Because I judge a manager in moments of trauma, right? So, and that's when he had a moment of trauma and he had an opportunity to react. What did he do? He had a chance to, with the left-back situation, he had, for me, he had two or three options. My preferred option, when I said it, was to play Gabriel out there as a as a left-back and people think, well, why would you do that? Well, particular games against Chuck Wazy, for example, based on Real. I thought Gabriel can play out there. We tend to build up in the 3 2 5 anyway. So have three at the back, push the right back on rather than the left back on, like we do with Tierney. Just flip around the other side, play Gabriel there. That was my preferred option. A lot of people said play Saka there. Straight away, play Saka there. Well, I was concerned about that because I think he's one of our best attackers. So I didn't want to move him out of that front line. And some people play Cedric there, but not many people said play Saka there. Right? So we play Saka there, Sheffield United. It works. I think we played Everton one or two games after that. And they moved Richarlison over to the right-hand side. We know he plays off the left. That was a signal to me to say, the game's up, son. Don't play that anymore. Do you know what I mean? And he continued to do that. And I think that was a concern because it cost us. It really cost us. You know, So some of the coaching things bothered me. Um some of the people things, I actually want to give him a bit of praise because I don't think, you know, and you can look at some of the characters in our dressing room that got Emery out of the club, basically. You know, Emery may have been not been suited for us, but he couldn't handle that dressing room. They ate him, right? They ate him alive, right? So Arteta fronted them up and it cost him games. It cost him games. And every time he made a selection... Mesut Ozil was tweeting, half the Arsenal fan base saying, you've got to play him, we're not scoring any goals, we're not getting no shots, remember that? No shots, Arsenal. Too many crosses. We need a creator, we need a creator. And he held out, he held out. He got them out, bombed them out, paid them off. Results. So he sacrificed himself. He managed the dressing room. He sacrificed himself in a way that Emery couldn't do. And Emery, and Wenger wouldn't dream of doing. He was an arm round the shoulder guy, which allowed a culture to develop in the club, which says... Players are in charge. We leave when we want to. We leave on a free transfer. You don't have to win at Arsenal. You can go to your little coffee shops in Highgate, enjoy yourself, and you ain't got to win, and you can still get the same Champions League money. That culture permeated. And only one person has attacked it, and that's Arteta. Now, does not excuse the coaching errors, Dan? Do you know what I mean? We can, we can talk about that. Do you know what I mean? We can all say that now. He doesn't excuse it, but this guy has attacked something First time manager, 39 years of age, he took them on. So he's trying to build out, he's trying to understand who is committed to me, who is committed to this club, who is committed to improving themselves. And I think he's finding that out now. I thought he discovered that around the FA Cup win. I thought he's done it, he's cracked it, he's, they're all on board. But they weren't, were they? <laughs> the Klasnik, the Mustafi, the Erzl, they weren't with him. Guendouzi, Torreira, they weren't with him. They weren't with him. So he had to clean them. Didn't get them all out. You know, didn't get Socrates out. Didn't get them all out. So we got to a situation where we had a bloated squad with people in the squad chipping away at the people that are on board. You can't do anything in that sort of environment. I think that's a bigger shame because all us fans want to see just a football match. And there are things happening off the pitch that are outside of our eye line and control. And it was affecting our results. And, you know, I'm I'm a man in my 50s, Dan, and I'm telling you, that period before Christmas was the worst period of my arsehole watching life. Without a shadow oh, I'm with you. Without I'm with you. Listen, I'm younger. I'm, I'm 33 years old. so And I've, I've been spoilt, really, growing up in the kind of early 90s and early 2000s with unbelievable football. Um, and some people say, you know, oh, you're unrealistic or you're too ambitious, Dan. But I am ambitious. And that's why I've given Arteta and the board and the owners a lot of stick. But I was yeah. looking at that football club thinking, I'm bored. 
It's unattractive. We're losing games. We're not playing well. I don't see a style. I can't see a formation that he's happy with. I can't see a team selection he's happy with. But let me give him some credit for the first time ever on his podcast, it seems, because I'm playing a different <laughs> role at the moment, because I'm a little bit of a host at the moment. I'm going to give him a little bit of praise. But I know you're being polite to me. You can let me have it. I am, I I am. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give him and Edu some praise, which I'm not a huge fan of Edu either. Um, but... I will say the recruitment has improved. Now, some of them have been poor, but you're going to get poor signings. Every signing is yeah. a risk, isn't it? It doesn't matter whether it's Messi, whether it's Haaland, or whether it's Ryan Bertrand on a free transfer. It's always going to be a risk, right? So, William was a risk, in my opinion. Um, and it wasn't a signing that excited me. But also, it wasn't a signing that I turned my nose up on for what the hell are you doing? Like, no, just no. I was, however, looking at the bad omen of the, you know, signings over the past decade and probably longer that we've had similar to that. They've been in their late 30s and are kind of washed up, so to speak, some fans say. Yeah. So along with Sabayos, who I've never been a fan of, if I'm honest with you, um, mm. I, no, <laughs> I thought those were the poor ones. However, I was quite ex quite ex uh, excited by Gabriel. I do like Gabriel. I like Pablo Marie. I could understand the Cedric signing and I can understand the Matt Ryan signing and we needed Martin Erdegaard type player. So some of the recruitment has improved. One player that has not had a great season um, in parts, but someone I absolutely love is Thomas Partey. I thought okay. that was a great signing as well. So yeah, I'm looking at the right. signings thinking, okay, off the pitch, we seem to be doing something right. We seem to be removing the culture, getting rid of the bad eggs, and we seem to be going for players that perhaps we've needed for quite a long time. We haven't had a Sol Campbell or Patrick Vieira signing for 15 years since they've left. So that was the kind of positives for me looking on the pitch. But talk to me about, just before we move on to what we do need, about where Arteta is going, do you think, with this style of play and formation? Because at times for me, it's been quite confusing. We've seen three at the back towards the back end of last season with an FA Cup win. Then it reverted back to a kind of 4-3-3. Three, three. We've seen three five twos. We've seen four two three ones. Where What's your kind of thoughts on that uh, process-wise? And what kind of style of play are we witnessing under Mikel Arteta? Because I think it's been quite confusing for some fans to recognise that. Yeah, so you, you up for a bit of tactical stuff, mate? You want to go? Mm. You want to go? I'd love it. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. I'm no good at it, but I listen to you, and I'm <laughs> and then I get it. So, <laughs> so we all we all have our views on on the game, right? So you know, I grew up um, in a period where Patrick Vieira was my favourite player, so I, I like my eyes go easy to that sort of player. I don't like turning up places and not being able to win the technical or win the fight. Right, so I like to have a team that can manage itself in all the different aspects of the game and compete. I think we've lost the art of the contest with the Arsenal Football Club. I think we are a very nice, attractive team on occasions, but when the going gets a little bit rough, we we can be outrun, out intense, out moved. So players like Daniel Sabias don't come so easy to my eye. They they don't. Right. So so we've all got our biases, and that's that's absolutely. I fine. agree. So what so what does I think he's um. He's doing so. Football now is much more positional than it's than formation, right? So you might start off in a four-two-three-one, but how you build up is in a two-three-five or three-two-five. You try to fill the five channels high up. You can choose how you do it. So let's take let's give take it back a year or so ago. So it's really really clear for people. Liverpool do the same thing. They do a two-three-five. So let's go back to Gomez Van Dijk. They have a shot to pressing three centre mids with Juan Aldum, Henderson, and Fabinho. By shot to pressing, I mean these guys are, they try to suffocate people into their half mm -hmm. and they keep you there. They're sharp into the tackles. When people try to break out, they're going to get smashed. And if you do break out, they've got two of the fastest sprinters at centre back. So good luck trying to outrun them. So what do they do? They keep you in, in, your, in your half. They pin you back, suffocate you. And so their five channels are caused by the two fullbacks. And they have the three forwards inside, you know, Mane, Firmino, and um, Salah, right? So, system, same system. Man City do it slightly differently. They did a few years ago. They have, they have a, they've gone three, three, four now, but they were doing a two, three, five. But they do it with number eight. Mm -hmm. They do it with De Bruyne, Silva coming inside, not fullbacks. They tuck their fullbacks in, invert them, and they do the same thing. So, you start with a system, but it's how you build up with the ball and how you, revert to off the ball. And a lot of teams off the ball do a 4-4-2. They have two people pressing and they have banks. So it's, so for me, the system is important up to a point. So I, put, I, I do like stability in my centre mid. 
You know, if you said to me, Villarreal, if you want to play Shaka left back, that's fine. But put El Nene and Party together. Don't mm-hmm. don't weaken two areas of your team, right? Don't make don't lean into Danny Tobias who can't do the running. He's not a good part. He doesn't offer you stability. He's a free spirit. So immediately then he puts more pressure on on our party. So what do we do? We lose a, our captain, really. Shaka is our captain. We we lose him from the from the centre of our pitch. We we weaken him at left back. We have somebody in midfield who weakens our midfield and also weakens our star signing. And we're not progressing it to the front line. So we're not even seeing what we can do up front. So whether the false line would have worked or not, it didn't really matter. And we never saw it. We didn't have any stability in the team. So I look for stability. So I like to have my centre mids to be strong and two-way. I like my centre backs to be quick and fast. I, I don't mind one full back pushing on. I like one to tuck in. But it didn't bother me. You can go, they can both go. But the ability to compete and keep people where they want them, I think a lot of Arsenal fans do not recognise how important off-the-ball strategy is. We focus on our system, our formation, what we do on the ball. But when you're coaching or you're playing football, if you think back to the games and how many touches you had, they reckon you have around 85, 86 minutes of the game, you're not actually on the ball. So it's a much more off the ball game. And we don't see that. We see the players on the ball and the last thing they've done. It's natural, right? We're fans, right? If our if our fullbacks kicking it into the seats, we're not having it. <laughs> the fact he's um run up and down 30 times and has pressed his winger and his winger has not gone past him, it doesn't matter. He's put two crosses in the seats. <laughs> and so your perception of the game is slightly different. You know? So um so I like to see a slid team in the center of the pitch, a front four diamond with one fullback pushing on. I think we've developed into that now. So Tilly's pushing on, we have a 10, and we have a, almost like a diamond shape up front, and we try to create in wide areas, triangles and diamonds in wide areas, overload back into the central zone and get shots there. For me, the thing that's wrong is we're playing too deep. Our centre-backs are too deep, so the pitch is too big, so we can't strangle people, we can't create waves of attack because we're not athletic enough to keep people in their half. We're not athletic enough at the centre back, so we drop away naturally. David Louise likes playing deep. Holding likes playing deep. They like to see the game. They don't like pressure. They don't like to be pressed. So they drop away. So everything becomes too big. So we can't play like the top teams play. We can't squeeze people. We can't suffocate people. We can't create pressure. So that's why that's why Dan people say we like to score the perfect goal. Because we almost have to, because we can't score unstructured goals. So you remember the second goal against um, Palace? Was it Palace the weekend? Was it Palace? Yeah, Palace. Oh, lost my mind. Sorry, mate. Bright, Brighton. Um, you mean. Brighton was Brighton, the weekend. Sorry, was Brighton. <laughs> yeah. Remember Brighton? Just the second goal, Shaka comes across, bang, tackle. Odegaard, slip pass, Pepe in goal. Transition. Yep. It's that stuff we need to do more of. And I thought it was quite interesting that with the crowd there, we were, I felt we were far more front-footed, far more aggressive. We pressed onto them. We were urged on by the crowd, taking shots. And this is, this is why I'm I'm loathe of doing these sort of end-of-season conclusions. It's not been a normal year. right? There have been certain, do, you think, do you think Fulham are getting out of our ground with a full crowd there, with a 1-1 draw? No chance. You know, it's just not been. But then again, do you think we're going to Old Trafford and winning 1-0? Probably not. There we go. Right? You know, so... um. So I just think I'm I'm very loath to massively conclude a lot, apart from the fact it's been a development year for us and we need to make significant change in that dressing room. And if the manager survives, fine. But if he doesn't, fine. But I tell you what's non negotiable. About ten ten of those players need to need to um find another seek another employment. <laughs> Well, it's a great way to end it, Clive, because my next kind of section was going to be about where we go from here, because we've talked enough about where it's gone wrong. I don't want to go over that again because it was just depressing. Let's talk about moving forward and what we need to do now. So I'm going to break it down. I'm not going to do one of these things where I give you 25 names of players and you say in or out because that's very boring Mm -hmm. and everyone's done that before. So I'm going to break it down in sections. So we'll start with the goalkeeping situation because I'd love to get your opinion on this one. This is an interesting one for me. We brought in Runnison as a goalkeeping backup and it was clearly a poor signing. So yeah. we brought in Matt Ryan, who's a gooner. And to be fair, the games he played, it looked like an OK signing. He cared. He's a massive gooner. And he's probably fitted in the dressing room quite well. And it looks like we could potentially sign him. But we've got Leno, which all people talk about is, ah, oh, we shouldn't have sold Martinez. 
I'm done with that. Yeah, he's an Aston Villa player now. I don't really want to mention the guy's name anymore. I loved him as a goalkeeper. Thought it was a mistake, but we're stuck with Leno now as our number one. Unless, of course, he leaves in the summer. Now, I want to ask you two questions here, really. What's your opinion of the goalkeeping situation? Does he suit Arteta's kind of style or potentially our philosophy if there is one and over the coming kind of, you know, do we stick with Leno as number one? Um, and do you, or do you think we need a new number one altogether? Like, what's your situation with the goalkeeper? I I think Arteta's style, by the way, you know, it, it depends on how you view it. You know, some people say he's working towards a 4-3-3. That's what he wants to end up. I'm not so sure. I think he's a 4-2-3-1 guy, but I don't really care. I think the system should be, I think we should use three at the back on occasion as a point accumulation system. We need to accumulate some points. Let's go to it for a couple of weeks. Just my most important thing for me is create different faces. Don't show people the same face all the time. Because guys out there that are sharper than me and you on their laptops will analyze us and come up with a plan, much like we did against us in the semi final. Right. So from a goalkeeping point of view, um I think Leno's okay. I thought he had a big dip around sort of January, February time this year, and he's come back. If he wants to stay fine, if he wants to go, I'm also fine with it. Um I think he doesn't come out for crosses enough in my opinion um i think he needs to be more proactive in his in his movement in the box i think he had a period where he put people in bad situations playing out from the back and he just had a moment of poor form he also plays too much because renison was so bad he played every minute of every game and i felt he suffered for that matt ryan's come in and i really enjoy watching him I really enjoy what he's sort of brought to the dressing room. He seems to have brought something positive. I love it when, it's not about he's a gooner, but I just it's obvious that he wants to be here. And I, I, I quite like that. I just quite like that because we'd all like to be there, wouldn't we? You know? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and he, he wants to be there and, he, and he's there for the right reasons, you know? He's not so much he's, got, he's a gooner, he's got passion. He's more like, you know what, he wants to be here and he really wants to bring something of himself to the club. You know, rather than, a few people recently, in my opinion, have come along because it's been convenient and they've taken something away from the club. They've taken cash without having to deliver something. Do you know what I mean? They've lied to us, said, oh, I was going to sign a contract, and then they've gone on a free. And we're there blaming the club. Trust me, these clubs are not stupid. These contracts get offered. They choose not to sign them. They're not stupid. They don't like let people walk away. And these players con the fans and give them messages and and take something away from the club. And I don't, I'm not, they're not fooling me. Do you know what I mean? So when I see, when I see a player that wants to be here, that chooses us, wants to be here for the right reasons, we need more of those. That's when the culture will change. And I like, I like Ryan. There is the IS goalkeeper. I think he's saying Onoma, is it? So the guy's yeah, got the yeah, drug yeah. On, 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 yeah, yeah. Onana, yeah. thank you, mate. Thank you. Um, I think, um, he looks interesting because he has got such a positive style in possession and the way he does, he's very bombastic. He flies off his line. He dominates the whole goal. He's on the edge of his area. He's very proactive. And you can look at goalkeeping positions and say to yourself, he, it, it may change in time. You, goalkeepers like Fraser Forster and Nick Pope, those big lumps who can't use their feet, that those days could be over. You know, you could be in a situation where you've got big, you know, bounding five foot eleven goalkeepers, but can still jump as a six foot three goalkeeper. But unbelievable, their feet can be part of the build up. Gives you that numerical advantage with your centre back, so you can push people on. I think the goalkeeping position is so underdeveloped, and there will be a lot more goalkeepers like well, Pickford's a decent goalkeeper for this. Obviously, Edison is like tip 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 top, and Anana is that the right way? <laughs> He's also got those characteristics and. So if a player like that comes in, that would be an interesting move to see mm. how that how he fits into the uh, build up from the back style. I think the, a typical example of that, listen, Edison and Allison have taken over, you know, the goalkeeping situation in terms of being top drawer, although Allison's had his issues this season. I think he's still a top drawer goalkeeper. But David yeah. De Gea is the perfect example, really, of how great he has been. And we've seen that change in terms of a modern day goalkeeper and him not being able to keep up with the times. And I think that, for yeah. me, is probably the best way to describe what you're saying. What I'll say just quickly, though, before we move on about Leno. Is it unfair for me, Clive, to say that take away this season and the problems that they've had? Is it unfair for me to say that the last two seasons, along with Aubameyang, 
I think he's probably been the most consistent Arsenal player. Is that yeah. is that unfair for me to say that? I think it's very fair of you to say that. And I got to be honest with you, when Elena went down at Brighton, his knee bent around, and I'm thinking this is a disaster. We're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. This is an absolute disaster because Emmy Martinez, who I've seen many, many times, was like a sieve, mate. Anything that was coming at him went through him. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking we're in real trouble. We're in real trouble. But Martinez came in and he found his moment. And we, again, we football fans have got amazing short memories. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we really have. <laughs> and, you know, and so, and we, you know, Martinez looks, Martinez does look like a very good goalkeeper. I think he's he's quite emotional. He has moments where when he does a mistake, he, he takes a little time to recover from it. He's an emotional guy. But that emotion takes him to a really high height. And I think he's he's decent with his feet. He's got an unbelievable sidewinder kick and he can throw it a million miles and he takes crosses and I think he's got a presence that defenders like. Mm-hmm. And we sold I say we sold the wrong keeper. We didn't have an offer for the other keeper. If we had two offers on the table, I wonder what we'd have done. Mm-hmm. You know, personally I think we we should have would we would have kept Martinez, he's homegrown. He's one of ours, been there since he was sixteen. Man, I wish it could have worked out slightly differently. But what I will say to you and all of your viewers, there's always another player that will come out of the sky. You know, and hopefully the price we pay is not too great. But Leno is not the problem at Arsenal Football Club at the moment. He's not one of the top ones. Totally agree with you. And I think that although we do need a, a, a backup goalkeeper that I imagine will probably be Matt Ryan if he wants to stay. And yeah. if Arteta wants to keep him, I don't think Leno is an issue unless he says, I'm out of here. I've had enough. There's rumours he doesn't get on with the new goalkeeping coach. So unless yeah. that happens and he does leave, then I think that, you know, we'll maybe look at, I mean, there's people in the chat saying Donnarumma, I think he's definitely staying in Italy over yeah. in Juventus, in my opinion. Um, yeah. And other options uh, like Oblak are just, for me, too unrealistic. So I yeah. think we need to be uh, looking at the Ajax guy, like you say. In terms of right back, Clive, this is a one I really wanted to get in with you because <laughs> I've said about fifteen hundred right backs play for us this season. Uh, it's clearly a position that we we need to look at. I think Callum Chambers has probably been our best option there, and if yeah. it was my opinion, we'd keep him for the kind of West Ham, Burnley, um, yeah. you know, Brighton type games. But we need somebody like a Kieran Tierney style, in my opinion, on that right hand side. What do you make of that position? Is that is it? Can we make that work with a Kieran Tierney figure on the right as well? Is that two attacking? Um, what's your opinions on that position, mate? I look at fullbacks as a balance. So it didn't bother me. Look, I, I tend to want to rock around. One of them push, one of them stay. Um, I do think we need... I I, I I do like Chambers as a right back. I think he's our best option. Um, but more importantly, I don't... We've got 72 million quid jogging up and down the right and touchline that's been completely annihilated by Bellerin playing inside him and doing, going in all the wrong areas. And it's been proven that a centre half stroke, right back stroke defensive midfielder by doing less has been a far more effective partner and allowed our star forward to do what he needs to do to affect the game. And you have to realise as a player, you have to recognise your role and adjust your game and say, no, I, I got, I got to carry some water for that guy. I've got to carry some water for him because he can do stuff that's uncoachable. And I think it's very important you read the room as a player. I think Lacazette does it well with the young kids when he plays in the forward. I think he does it well. I think he reads the room. He gives them what they can't give the team. He gives it, and he gives of himself. And that's what Bellerin needs to do. And he didn't. He kept playing his game, which affected everybody else's game. So I think I've got a, I've got a few names out there. Um, I do like this again. This is this is a white scout YouTube scouting, right? So I do like. Um, I've never seen a live game. I do like Emerson Royale, Real Betis. I do like him. I yep. think I look at him profile wise. I think you're you're exactly it for me. You're you're quick, but you've also got a bit of the Chambers physicality. So I like him. I like the guy at RB Leipzig. Maku, RB Leipzig. Bukaleli. I quite like him. Yep. Um, I do know that we have we are quite interested in Max Aaron's from a yeah and why wouldn't we be you know you know like most it. teams most teams would be interested in him. I grew up I grew up in Luton so I he comes from Luton so I do have I know people around him. 
He went okay. to Norwich. As, he went to Norwich as a kid. That's what I'm going to say. He went to Norwich as a kid. I know a lot more. I tell you afterwards. He went to Norwich as a kid. <laughs> um, and I know how he went to Norwich. I know he's been number 10 stroke right winger, so he's very technically quite smart. Um, he's developed quite well. In his first year in the Premier League, he didn't didn't shine from an assist perspective. He only had one assist, I remember. Um, and he crossed the ball to the other guy that comes from Luton called Jamal Lewis, who also went to Norwich. And I know a little bit about him as well. He's the left back wow. from Norwich, who then went to Newcastle. Another player I like, yeah. Yeah, if they want Joe, if Newcastle want to give us Jamal Lewis as a backup left, Jamal Lewis as a backup left back and twenty five million quid for Joe Willock, then uh, that makes a lot of sense to me because he's yeah. um, he could do getting away from Steve Bruce because he's not helping him. I mean, if he played for <laughs> Arsenal and he would attack, and uh, we need him to be the player he actually is, which is to really be really high up on left hand side, where Steve Bruce hasn't got a clue what to do with him. So, um, so I like. I like I, I like Aaron's, but I'm not sure of his solidity defensively. I think he need he's to be proven. But I I look at it as a balance. You've got one defensive rock that's not super athletic in Chambers for those big ugly days, and you've got somebody for the sunny days at the Emirates when everything is nice. We're in charge. We're pushing people back. You've got a technical right back who can do a bit combined knows where to be, manipulate the ball much more than Bellerin can, can use his left foot, can really drive through and drive to the line on the inside of, of a of a Pepe or really support him on the outside, but support him technically. You know, a, you know when our players have a, are on a technical wavelength, you can see it. When you see Saka and Smith are on a technical wavelength, Tierney and Saka, Tierney, anybody basically, but Tierney and Saka, they're on a wavelength and they, the combinations are they're quite obvious, aren't they? So as long as someone has got the technical ability to create shapes with our right-sided player, whether it be Saka or Pepe, I think that's really important. So Aaron's I like, but if you ask me to choose one, I think I would choose Emerson. But probably, i, I go back on that, I'd probably choose McAlealy, actually, because I know it's expensive, but if you want to do something, we need to add people to our first 11 that are stick-on players. So don't mess about with development. Chambers is a backup, so you get someone that's so much better than him that it's obvious. Do you know what I mean? And he plays. And I think if we want to change us from eighth to fourth, we've got to find about 15 points. That's what we've got to find. We're not going to do that and waiting for people to develop and settle in. They need to really be top quality. Uh, listen, I could not agree more with what you're saying there. I think when I look at the position itself, We've tried Maitland-Niles there. It didn't work out. He doesn't want to play there and he's gone on loan. Hector Bellerin, we need to move on from him. The minute that, oh, Alexis Sanchez wants to win too much, come out of his mouth, I was like, see you later. You're not part of my club as far as I'm concerned. Take care and see you later. Thanks for your service. When it looks at the players like Cedric, for me, not terrible. Had a really good uh, couple of games, uh, the Emirates. Mm. But I'm not so sure that he's the answer. So we're looking at these players thinking he's okay, he's okay, he's okay. We haven't got one that's like, wow, outstanding. But I think you're dead right in terms of Callum Chambers. The way I see it is this. Lamptey and Aarons, I like them. But defensively, I had question marks over both of them because they're great going forward. And I think that what they can bring to the the, uh, the Kieran Tierney side of things, they can do going forward. I'm just not so sure defensively they're as sound. So yeah. I'm with you in terms of the Emerson signing. I think that would be great. And you know what? I probably think it's the most realistic, if I'm honest with you, out of all of them. So I think the the Leipzig shout is is potentially unrealistic nice to in terms have. of the, nice, nice exactly that yeah, exactly yeah. that but one player I, I did think of first of all was Klosterman now I know he's playing more of a centre back mm. at the moment for Leipzig but he's got the ability to play on either side and he's very defensively sound so that was yeah. an option that I had a, quite a way back um, but that again looks very unrealistic with both of their centre backs looking to be off <laughs> so it doesn't look like that's an option uh, but right back's 100% an issue Clive but one thing I want to talk to you about is the left back position because my favourite mm -hmm. player Hands down, is Kieran Tierney. I love everything about him. He is my favourite player by five. He's got the passion. He's got the leadership qualities. I think he's a captain material. And I think that he is one of the most exciting to watch down that left-hand side. My worry with him, he's got a little bit of an injury issue. So yeah. we are going to need a backup left-back. I can't stand Kolasinac. I think he's the worst left back we've ever had. Uh, okay. As far as Andre Santos is concerned, he's in that bracket for me. Terrible. Um Maitland Niles did a job there in the FA Cup final, but it doesn't look like he wants to be a fullback. Mm -hmm. And I've got this issue with Sackers and Chackers and Cedric's going there. I just don't like that. For me, I'm going to say it. 
I think the Ryan Bertrand signing is a little bit lazy for me because it's a 32 year old another one we've seen it yes he's Premier League proven but I speak to a couple of Southampton fans and they say you can have him he's been dreadful all of our goals have come down that side of the pitch it's been a terrible time he's kind of done really so people might say that that's really harsh and that he would be a good backup signing I'm not so sure that it would be I'd be more willing to go with someone who's a little bit more younger and vibrant that's going to know they're going to play potentially 20 at least games for Arsenal because of Tierney's fitness record. What's your opinion on this situation? It's clear we need another left back up, left back, in my opinion, Clive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good opinion. I agree with the opinion. Um, Tierney, as a young kid in Scotland, was a, was a star. He had pelvic issues up there and they played him through him. They played him through him and they did look after him. Um, my other team I like, I don't get in, in trouble. I do like Rangers, so I do follow Scottish football okay. a little bit. And um and so I'm I have i have had my eyes on that that league. So when Tierney came to us, I had concerns. I generally had concerns. I thought he's he he he's, he joined injured, didn't he? He was literally injured when he joined. So this is not a new story. We need to we need to make sure he only plays about twenty five games that really, really matter. So we need to find somebody to play. 15 games next year, maybe, you know. So, um, Ryan Bertrand, Leicester seem to be going for him. Um, mm. I've just read a little bit today that they're going to get him. And I think he suits them. And that's not to degrade him or anything like that. They've, they've got a young left-back called Luke Thomas. He's 19 years of age. Bright player. He needs an older mentor. He's going to be their guy, but he needs an older guy. So, Bertrand has got a role there. They're in Europe. There's a lot of games. So he has a role there. If I'm Bertrand, I'm going to Leicester, you know, because I'm going to get minutes. These kids can't play every minute. So my role is clear. Do you see what I mean? If he yeah. comes to Arsenal, I'm literally carrying the tea in his bag, you know, and that's it's not going to happen. So the type of player you need next to a Tierney is somebody, I think, a bit younger. Somebody that says, you know what, I'm prepared to to wait, to push, Know my know my role to learn and develop, but I don't have to develop immediately. So there's two or three options that are out there that I sort of like. Um, one is the guy at Derby called Lee Buchanan. Again, he's a he's a sharp player. He's quite technical. He's um, quite good in the air. He's quite progressive. He's a bit bouncy, a bit like Chilwell. You know, like a bouncy runner. No, it's actually a bit like Shaw actually, a bouncy mm. runner a little bit thicker set but he's really technical on the ball and he, and he runs downhill i quite like him um there's a player that i like but not not many people do he's at bournemouth a guy called lloyd kelly um he i think he played for bristol rovers or bristol city with his bristol city when he was younger bournemouth bought him for about eight million quid he's about six foot two very long striding left back but could also play left center back in the three i quite like him i think he's got a lot about him and it could be someone we could use in the central areas of defence as well. So I quite like him. I like Jamal Lewis, funny enough. I think he's been wasted, mm. uh, as I said earlier. I think he would suit. Um, I do think the kid has just signed for Bayern Munich, actually, today, which is a joke. A kid from Reading, Reading signed for yeah. Bayern Munich um, for free. And he's perfect for us, called Omar Richards. And I think he is a wonderful technical player. And really is a street footballer. I really like him. So, yeah, there are players out there. I, I would like to see us go from within the league, you know, if you know what I mean, within the championship or within the league. I think, again, we need to have people settle really, really quickly. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think we do that enough. I think we're too, I think we're too snobby. Do you know what I mean? Mm, so, um, mm, 100%. So I would like to see us do that a little bit more. So yeah, they're, they're my picks, really. But um, mm. there's one more that I liked and I would really like to see come, but I talked to Tom about him and Tom slaps me about it. So um, there's a guy at Barcelona called Junior Firpo. Um, he he went for Real Betis to Barcelona, very attacking left back, has struggled to establish himself. Arsenal nearly went for him in January. He turned us down, didn't want to come. I think that was a critical moment because I... We all saw what happened when left back got injured. Yeah. You know what I mean? We didn't get that back up. We didn't get that player. We also looked around virtually in January. So again, if you think about what could have the season could have been, these little mistakes are really costly. You know, really costly. So Junior Firpo is really, really fast. He marked um Mbappe in the Barcelona versus PSG game, and Mbappe did not get past him once. 
cannot be outrun. He is lightning. He is lightning. And so I was like, I, I've got a little hunch for him, but um, he's situated to Barcelona. It's going to be interesting what happens there. That club's in turmoil. He's not playing mm. enough, but he's a player that's reeks potential, that's been underutilized and suits the attacking way that we play. So that's my little sneaky hunch. I like that. I like that a lot. And I'm not a fan of the Ryan Bertrand sign. It does look like he's going to Leicester. Another fullback who's linked with Leicester that I really would like and I thought was unrealistic but if he's linked with Leicester he could be linked with us is, is Nuno Mendes up here at Sporting Lisbon I think he's got the potential to be a very very good left back um, and Tarek Mitchell as well at uh, Crystal Palace was linked but I believe yeah. he signed the new contract yes. which is a shame yeah, because I quite shame. liked him mm. yeah mm. I, I had a little sneaky one for him as well I thought he's not going to sign he's not going to sign we've got to have him the he signed <laughs> so, mm. yeah, massive shame because I think he's the only one who's going to be left by the sounds of things Crystal Palace yeah. have got a lot of players they're losing and obviously they've got a manager now well managerless now yeah. so uh, yeah they were my shouts to be fair but backup left backs needed Clive I want to move into the defence because I think it's real, really clear to see for everybody my frustrations Arteta's frustrations Arsenal fans frustrations just pick two and stick with them but you can't do it. It's David Luiz and holding. It's, it's Gabriel and holding, which I think is a nightmare. It's Pablo Marie and holding. It's, we've not seen Gabriel, Gabriel and Pablo Marie, which would be something I'd like to have seen because I don't think that, although they're both left-footed, that's a massive issue because Keanu and Adams and Torre and Campbell were both right-footed and it worked. Yeah. But I look at the situation and I think, I still feel we might need one. Now, whether or not that one is William Saliba is yet to be decided. I really hope it is. I like what I'm seeing. I like what I'm hearing. I liked Miss Sinetti and what I was hearing. And apparently he's been an absolutely amazing signing for Nice this season. So maybe he is the guy to slot next to Gabriel, who I think is our best centre-half. Pablo Marie is good cover. I'm not so sure I can continue after that, though. Rob Holding, for me, frustrates me. I see the passion. I see the love. And I see the, the, the want to do well. But I see him getting beat. And that just frustrates me. And my biggest, my pet hate with footballers, whether they're Arsenal players or not, is doing the same things wrong <laughs> week in week out and I see him break dancing against Jack Grealish at the Emirates then we go back to Aston Villa he's marking space instead of Ollie Watkins and then what looks around and wonders why they've scored I see him get beat by Raheem Sterling then two weeks later he gets beat by Iota in the box by header so they're the sort of things that worry me about Rob Holding I don't think he's going anywhere um, I think Arteta likes him he's even given him the armband but I honestly believe there is a situation where we could see Saliba and Gabriel and my question to you is, oh, would you be happy with that or do we still need a centre-back? On paper, I'm, I'm happy with it. Uh, Gabriel, I like. He has moments of uh, indifferent distribution, shall we say. And um, sometimes he can go fishing. By that, I mean he chases after the ball and right to the halfway line. And sometimes you've got to know when to drop off and hold your space and hold your line sort of thing. But but one-on-one -on -one defending, he's excellent. You know, if you just think back to what he did to Harry Kane at, at the home game, he... Mm he absolutely sorted him out in every single way. And when you see that, you know you've got a player. It's all about smoothing off the rough edges. Saliba now, I, again, just done the Arsenal Vision podcast, and he was my breakout player of the season prediction. All right? And he hasn't mm. played one game. Mm. You know, I've, we've all watched him. We've all YouTubed him to death. We've all watched the Nice games. There's not a lot. There's a, there's a lot to like, isn't there? Mm. What... There's just this one sort of variable we can't really predict is that he's a young man. He's 19, 20 years of age. And he may have the body of a 28-year-old, but he's a 19, 20-year-old. And he has to hold Arsenal's defence. Now, last time I looked, we're not the most forgiving bunch in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Football is not a forgiving game for any, for any player. I mean... You know, joking aside, look what's happened to Marcus Rafford over, overnight. It's, it's not nice, right? Fans are becoming very, very critical in a in a nasty way. Clubs are almost scared. We we're we're actually quite good here, but clubs are almost scared to put young players out there. You know, I was watching Twan Zabi last night, and he suffered some terrible abuse. If he misses that penalty, I dread that he can't go home. Right? That's mm. the situation. That's the situation that we're on. Ron, I know for I tell you now, Dan, I know I'm, I know for sure, I know this is hundred percent that Arsenal have counsellors and in their club to help people deal with the abuse that they get. So mm -hmm. when they ha when they have all this, they know all this, why are they gonna put a nineteen year old and a twenty two, twenty three year old together at the back? I'm not sure Arteta's gonna do it. 
we all know that he's got, I'll say he's got 10 games, but we all know the, 10, the first 10 games of the season don't go well. And that no excuse environment we spoke about is there. You know, the players have gone, new players have come in, no Europe. We're not, we're not going to be happy, are we? We're not going to no. be happy. And so is he going to, is he going to do it? I don't know. We'll find out in pre-season. I hope he's the one because the way you have, a way you build a defence, you have different types of centre-backs. You have your defensive block centre-back, which I think is Gabriel, and you have your possession centre-back. So David Luiz is what we call a possession centre-back, right? Saliba is a possession centre-back. His ability to carry and switch play and pass good distances. Totally agree. We need that. Rob Holding is not a possession centre back, right? So, Pablo Marie has got the ability to pass the ball. We football is developing now, where your centre backs almost like deep midfielders in possession. They have to have the ability to pick people up, play between the lines, as well as defend for their lives. We can't afford to have defenders that can't kick the football. You heard <laughs> me say, it. Bellerin can't kick it, right? Cedric can. Chambers is not bad. Um, holding can't he can't pass. He can't pass. We can't have this at Arsenal Football Club. We can't have a situation where teams can stand on parties' toes and we can't build up. Do you see what I mean? We have the ability to build Great. up from the back so that the players in midfield can't be blocked off. So we're easy to stop. We're not no, I'm quite a positive fan generally. I do I know what I'm, I can see what's wrong. I can explain it. But I can't explain a situation where Arsenal Football Club is in the European semi-final and Rob Holder is leading out the team mm. when in, in August, September, he was about to sign for Newcastle and he's now captive of a new contract. That type of thing. I'm not rubbishing him, but I think it's a, it's a red flag for where we are. I would like that situation not to, to happen. Well, I know when we're on our way back, when I can see that type of player not being the first pick at right centre back. It doesn't mean he's not a fine player. It doesn't mean he hasn't got a place at Arsenal. But that can't be. He's our Lovren. Do you see what I mean? He can't be playing every week because that means we're not in shape. And we're not in shape. So this is like an indicator of where we are. So it's not a critique of him. I think he's fine. He, I, he, gets, he gets danced around. His feet are point outwards. He's good when we're being pressured. He's a mid-table centre back. He's great in his box in the air once he's back there. But we don't want we want people on the halfway line who can build play and run with people, run with Ollie Watkins, run down the sides with Mane. It's not gonna happen, is it? It's not gonna happen. We know it's not gonna happen, so we need to upgrade our position. So that's my view on it, really. So yeah, fair play. And I think you're spot on with what you're saying. And everybody in the chat is 100% agreeing, saying you're speaking facts. And I think you're spot on. I, I would love to see Saliba come in. I do worry that perhaps we're going to be putting quite a lot of pressure on the young lad. And maybe he should be our kind of third choice centre back with Pablo Maria as our fourth choice. And we get that number one next to Gabriel. Who that's going to be? I don't know. Looks like Canate could be gone his way to Liverpool. I'm a huge fan mm. of him from Leipzig. Um, Andrew Brown, but nice. Yes, that is another issue. It's probably suit Arsenal perfectly, <laughs> uh, being injury prone. But um, yeah, I think I think that's an option. Um, I've always been a fan of an old school centre back, to be honest with you. But um, I think a few of those are potentially unrealistic. Um, but money talks, Clive. So we shall see what happens. Mm. I want to move into the midfield because I said to, on AFTV the other day that I think it's the worst midfield we've seen since probably 94, 95. No, no, no joke there. I think it is so poor and I'm a huge fan of Thomas Party. And then I think it stops after that. Um, the reason I'm going to not give a lot of love to Granit Xhaka, albeit he's been good this season in the majority of the part of it, is he can't be trusted. And I hate players who can't be trusted because for every great pass and for every great free kick and for every great tackle, there's always grabbing somebody's throat at Burnley, kicking the ball yep. against Chris Wood, giving away a penalty and giving away a free kick. And I think for five years we've seen that. It's time to move on. It's time to upgrade. We need somebody to come in next to him. Uh, and I mean, when I say next to him, I mean Thomas Party. And I don't think Granit Xhaka is a person who would want to sit on the bench. So as yeah. far as I'm concerned, I hope the Roma rumours are true. Can't believe Jose is going for him as his first signing. That's another story. So I think when you look at the situation with Granit Xhaka, it's time to move on. And I absolutely love 
Yves Basuma from Brighton. I think he's a perfect example of what would allow Party to progress because I don't think Party is this anchor in midfield that everyone thought he was going to be a, a Vieira. He's very, very much more um, like a Vieira, actually, in my opinion, or a Gilberto Silva. And the fact that they don't just sit there and be a deep line play, a clay, playmaker type. He is a very box to box, in my opinion, and could do a lot more, but he hasn't been allowed to do a lot more because I think our midfield has been very, very weak when he's got people like El Nenny and Sabayos next to him and at times Granite Chaka. Bissouma, for me, walks straight into our first team. Clive, talk to me about our midfield. <laughs> yeah, so you did a good job there, mate. And so Thomas Party, I think, is misunderstood. Um, I have discussions with um, guys on the podcast. They don't. <laughs> I like him, but I, didn't, I sort of understand him. Statistically, his profile is actually closer to Thiago than any other midfielder in Europe. So you look at Thiago, you look at Thomas Party, you think, well, how can they be the same? Yeah. Their numbers, their numbers are the same. Because the way they take on the ball, the way they move the ball, their passing, their passing angles are very, very similar. They both pass with disguise. You know, they both want to go through the lines with disguise. So they had the top take-ons in the whole of Europe, not last season, the year before. So think about Thiago when you're thinking about Thomas Party. But Thiago's got Fabinho at Liverpool, hasn't he? Yeah. Right. And um and so, <laughs> Yeah, he's got those players around him. And, and so at Arsenal, we do what we do, we, we sign someone forty five million quid. And we say, Well, we spent a lot of money. Let's give you a little cape. You can wear your underpants on the outside of your shorts. And can you look Absolutely. after the centre? Can you look after the centre bar midfield? We'll put you we'll put three stone days of bias to your left. We won't bother giving you someone on your right. You got Odegaard up up the pitch playing number ten. You've got a right back who's bobbing down the right-hand side. But you've got to hold the whole of midfield on your own. And everyone knows we're going to pass to you. And you've got to get out of jail all the time. It's ridiculous. I think we have an issue as fans when we sign somebody expensive. We have such expectations on them. And it's not just us as fans. I think the, the club overburdened our players. We've done this consistently. We've overburdened our best players by giving them too many things to do. What we should be doing is cosseting them and giving them exactly what they need to be absolutely the player that we bought. So if you buy a Thomas Party, you absolutely, the first thing you do is you've got to get him the best partner you possibly can get. And that is Basuma, right? Without a doubt. Because he covers the things he can't do. Basuma's quicker. He's sprinty. He can play six. He can play eight. He's happy at the base. He wants to be at the base and he wants to give it to the guy next man up. He was number 10 or number eight. He is the perfect partner for him. I wish he was left footed; it'd be even better. But he doesn't have to be left footed. We just become used to that, right? So, so whenever you buy a player or see a player in your team, think about his strengths. Don't uncover his weaknesses. So, what do we do with Shaka? So, people don't like Shaka. Shaka's fine. He's fine with party because party does a lot of stuff he doesn't have to do. And so, what you have to do with Shaka, you have to recognize the personality that he has. He's somebody who wants to be everything to everybody if you allow him to be. That's why he's dashing across his area, making fouls, giving things away. He wants to be everywhere. So you've got to take that away from him. You've got to give him somebody that actually is better mobility-wise than him. And Shaka then falls into a different role, a much more of a stabilising role, a much more of a distributing role. And it's no coincidence his party's coming. He's looked a lot calmer and a lot better, apart from the Burnley Chris Wood thing. Right? So... um. And he looks like a good player. And he's the only one of our players to make it into a team of the season. He was the only one. It's no... So I read some of my mates today. Giles said something on Twitter. He said, he sort of said, Shaka is holding us back while being one of our best midfielders. I sort of know what he means. I think we all know this is it. There's nothing else to see here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We've seen... There's nothing else to see. With five years, we've seen the mistakes, we've seen it. We're not going to get to the promised land carrying this guy. You know, we're just not going to do it. It's no criticism of him. His mistakes are obvious. We all know them. We've all cried ourselves oh, yeah. to sleep after them. <laughs> we're beating Burnley at home. They we're killing them, and he gets himself sent off. You know, we lose the game 1 0. They don't have a shot. We lose it 1 0. That sort of stuff has been really costly. But he's also had many, many other games where he's been our best player. But we've seen it here. There's nothing else to see here. We have to move on. We have to move on. And the reason why, that is because we're playing a game which is not 
a top four game. We're playing a game which is too much, too many people standing away from people. We need people to go and engage the game, go and get people, go and get after them. And I think Shaka, because of his lack of mobility and agility, doesn't want to go and get people because he's afraid of getting beat. When you're quick and you're sharp and you go into the tackle, you're confident, you take the ball off people. And I think this is a key thing for everyone to recognise. Football is structured. We look structured because that's all we can do. You know, we need people that drive distraction and non-structure. And that's why we've got to move on from Chaka. Nothing personal, just a, just a change. I totally agree. And, you know, he's not a bit of people on this podcast think I give him a hard time. And you know what? I probably have done in the last few years due to the frustration of some of his mistakes. And the fact that he keeps making the same mistakes does frustrate me. I think it's time to move on. I don't think he's somebody that wants to come on like El Nenny does when we're 2 0 up and he just sees the game out. That's not him. So I think it's time to say goodbye and try and make some money on him as well. I was really jealous to find out today that Samare from Lille is now pretty much going to Leicester, another player I really like. Yeah. Um, and I think we'll do very, very well there. Tielemans apparently looking to leave. Oh, a player, another player I really like, but very unrealistic now. Um, so I do think it's a huge weakness for us in midfield. And I think that if Pesuma was to come in, we'll move on to uh, our creativity now. But I think that if Pesuma was to come in, I think you'll see a very, very different midfield with Pesuma and Thomas Partey, as long as they stay fit um, next season. Um, I really agree with that. So I think Pesuma would be fantastic. Fabrizio Romano has come out today and said that he's not a number one priority, but we are being yeah. heavily linked with him for many, many weeks now. Liverpool, so Liverpool I hope... like him. Liverpool like mm, him as well. And that's the worry. That's a problem. Because mm. he, he may not start every game for them. And I think that's the key. What I've read, again, I don't know everything... What I've read is money's not the issue. He wants to play. If he comes to Arsenal, he's playing. And mm. I think I think that's our that's our ace card. I think you're right. And I, I hear Bisuma's a gooner. Fingers oh, yeah. crossed. Yeah. We shall see what he does in the summer. Um, moving forward into that creative midfield, um, we're going to be quite wrapping it up quite um, quite easily now because I don't think there's many outs left. Um, I think when you look at the Erdegaard situation, there is a player there. Unfortunately, mm. he's been missing since West Ham. I saw him a little bit against Brighton. I'll give him credit there. Yeah, and he did good. get a good, nice assist against Palace. But I wanted to see him absolutely annihilate and dominate because I think there is something there. However, I like Kusamoa. I love Jack Grealish, will be unrealistic. I'm a huge fan of Emi Buendea. But I look at the situation and think we might need a couple of those signings because... Smith Rowe, albeit, has come into the mix and looks like a, a great player and I believe a number 10. But a little bit like Saliba, because he was so good for the first like six months of his Arsenal career, really, let's be honest, Smith Rowe, I don't think we should just be saying, you're a number 10 no matter what happens. I think we need to get somebody else in there, Clive. What's your opinion? Well, yeah, I think um, if I go to the Central back to the Central quickly, I just saw a couple of comments fly through. Yeah, sure. Go on, if, yeah, we lose, sure. if we lose Shaka we're losing Ceballos. El Nani's the last year of his contract. We probably need two in there. I agree. We need two signings. So it'll be interesting what we do next. That Sanderberg looks quite interesting as a player, a different style of player. So that's one to watch. In attacking midfield areas, I actually think um, one of the highlights of the season have been the development of Saka, Martinelli, Smith Rowe. I mean, those three players are just like going to be gold. But we cannot be in a situation where Saka has played more minutes than anybody else in our team, apart from maybe Leno, I believe. He's 19 years of age. I read in the press today that Jack Wilsh has been released by Bournemouth. Yeah. 28, 28, 29. Um, yep. I know he had injuries, but we got overexcited about him when he was young. We overplayed him. We criticised him, Bellerin. In my opinion, we overplayed him when he was younger. We didn't have a backup right back. He never got the rest. We overplayed him. He got a cruise ship. He's not the same physical animal as he was a few years ago. If we do this to Bukaya Saka, I'll be, I'm a very quiet man, non-confrontational, but I'll be going down the club myself to, to knock out anybody I see because <laughs> we cannot may we cannot lose this player. We cannot do this to this player. We can't do it to Smith Rowe. I'd like to see us go for Emmy Brendier, actually. And people automatically pick the first 11s 
but actually we have to look at the minutes people are playing. We have to bring them along slowly while their bodies are developing and they're still growing. We cannot overplay them. Brendia comes in and people say, well, that's me throw. What? So what? I want to see Smith Rowe have a similar amount of minutes this year over the whole season. I want I to see Saka. I want to see Saka have about eight hundred minutes less than he's having right now. I want to be in a situation where we do not have to play that kid in all eight different positions, and he can sit there, rest, get himself ready for the games we really need him, and deploy him like a missile. We must do this a lot more, and we can only do that when we have a similar quality of player around him. And Martelli didn't play for the first. Half of the season due to injury, we were very careful with him. He's now arriving and he will arrive next year. He's generally going to play off left-hand side and maybe late substitute up front. That's what he's going to be next year. Smith Rowe can play left, he can play right, he can play central. Saka can play anywhere. He can go. He can play anywhere on the pitch and he can go and get the hot dogs afterwards and dish them out to you. He can do anything you like. Um so having a brand here who's also a player that plays on the right but can play mm. 10 and he can play on the left as well, two-footed, creative carrier, shoots. He's slightly different style. He takes shots. He's two-footed on his shots, two-footed dribbler. If anything, he's closer to Smith Rowe but more from the right side, so the right half space coming in. His creative numbers when he was in the Premier League were outstanding in a team that didn't create a lot of chances and didn't get a lot of assists, but he still did well. He didn't score as much as he did in the championship. They're saying that he was the best championship player there's ever been. There's a moment you have to get people, and I think he is the one to get. Again, he's going to settle. He's going to settle into a group of attacking midfielders. He's 23 years of age, 24 years of age. He's, he's going to settle into a group and create a new a new broom. If you add like Balogun into that group, You've got a group of young men that are only going one way. And our job is to nurture them and bring them in at the right times, not overburden them as we've done to young players in the past. So that's my key message. Fair play, and I'm with you on Emi Buendia. I've always been a fan. I actually liked him last season in the Premier League. A lot of people said, oh, he only scored mm. one goal or whatever it be. But actually, he's absolutely killed it in the Championship, and I think he would be great. And I think that you need 15, 16 players. You know, you don't need 11. And it's not about, we've got Smith Rowe in the number 10. No one else should be getting ahead of him. We've got Saka on the right. Nobody else should be getting ahead of him. I'm actually a massive fan of Pepe. I'm a massive fan of Saka. Yeah, I love Martinelli and Smith Rowe. And Pepe's played behind 15 different right backs, come to a league which is not known to him. £72 million pound weight on his shoulders. And for me, he's been my player of the season. And everyone's going to sit there and say, oh, it's Saka, it's Saka, it's Saka. But you know what? I haven't seen Saka for about six weeks because of the reasons that you mentioned earlier. Pepe, yeah. I've seen throughout the whole season. And he might have scored goals against Dundalk. He might have scored goals against Rapid Vienna. But you can only score goals against the teams that Arteta plays you against. And I think he's been mismanaged. I think William was playing way too many games ahead of him. I think yeah. he was asked to go on the right. I think he was asked to go on the left. And sometimes we saw him up front for a couple of games. And the other thing about Pepe is I look at his actual numbers. Very impressive for the amount of minutes he's played. I compared them to Freddie Lundberg and Robert Perez the other day and everyone laughed at me. But the reason I was doing that was because Freddie Lundberg and Robert Perez, his first two seasons at Arsenal, albeit played a few less games, but I'm talking about appearances there, not games, not full 90-minute games. You'll be astounded. They are outstanding in comparison to those two players. Now, albeit they're completely different, I actually see Pepe as a lot more of a goal threat than the other two, if I'm honest with you. But yeah. I do think that we have given this guy less credit than he deserves. And the last five, six games, our best player by far. So, fire day system and watch this kid shine because he has got so much ability in my opinion he's only going to be 26 this year we're going to see the best years ahead of him and he's one to watch for me Clive so I'm a huge fan of Martinelli I like Smith Rowe and Saka of course I do but I don't want them free playing 90 minutes for 38 games of the league season we do no need chance. some other players yeah. so Pepe for me hugely before we come on to the Lacazette and Aubameyang and Balogun situation just give me a rundown of Pepe because I, 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 I'll be interested to know what you think yeah, well, when I, when I watch football, you can. I would say it to the guys all the time. I like stuff that almost looks uncoachable, right? And when I see him score goals, I'm thinking, well, wow, how have you done that? You know, his goals are spectacular, and they're spectacular from a football perspective. 
you look at the goal at the weekend, the way he waited, side-footed it through someone's legs from about four or five yards away and hit the side netting. That's that's not normal. If you watch him closely, Dan, and I'll, this is one for your viewers, right? Watch how his ankles go right the way out and he gets a massive contact space on the ball. So he's almost like he's hitting it like a flat foot on the ball, which means the ball goes exactly where he wants it to go. Most people use their instep and they point their foot more. He can flex his ankles all the way back and he gets wonderful side foots off it. It gets great shapes, great angles. His finishing off both feet is stunning. The first goal, again, they teach you, you get the ball, you pop up your first touch, you pop it up, so your second touch is obvious. But he hits it down into the ground. Impossible to save when you bounce it into the net. It's just this is just he makes it look so easy. Mm. It's like, wow, where's that come from? You know, and um so the stuff he does is just uncoachable. So now the job is okay, where does he do his work? And my job would be if I'm like on the sideline, where does he do his best work? How often can I get him into those areas? Because in those areas, I ain't got nothing to tell him. I can't tell him anything because it just comes to him. But I'm asking him to do things he He's not so good at doing, or um, or are taken away from what he is good at doing. So my job is to look around and say, who is my killer second forward? Well, it's him. You know, so he used to be a Bamiyang off the left, but it's now him off the right. You know, he's a second forward. So we have to get him into the zones of the pitch where he can do damage. And when he's in the box, mate, I ain't got nothing to say. I've just got to watch it, you know, because I, I don't know what's coming. You know, it's double nutmeg versus walls in the, in the corner at walls. Double nutmeg, slight right foot. Just done. It's like, it's some of these goals are incredible. With the West Brom goal, top corner. Mm. What's going on here? This stuff is bubbling under. And we, he's here now. So people that like the manager will say, you know what, the manager who I have heard has spent more time with him than any other player in our squad, coaching him. Right, So I have also heard that he does a lot of analysis on his game. And he has done that since he was at Lille. You know, so so the player that we perceive is a little bit sloppy on the ball, a little bit lackadaisical, dodgy touch here and there. People think it's a bit easy, as in a bit cool and casual. He's not the player that he actually is. And now we're starting to see that the extra work and the extra coaching is coming to the fore. So I'm hoping he is at least a fifty two million pound player next season and um he can show us what we got, right? So um yeah, I'm a huge fan. I'm so glad. Again, it gives you another reason. Don't always jump to conclusions. When you see talent, don't forget it. Once you see it, it's there. It's just gone for a little while. <laughs> you know, it will come back. It will come back. Well, I'm a huge fan. And I think there's there's two things for me to say on that as well. I think he, the amount of goals he scores that are quite different is, is amazing. But the other thing, Clive, is he got sent off against Leeds. And he could have gone one way or the other. You know, I thought Arteta was a little bit harsh on him compared to the following week when Chaka grabbed someone by the throat and he just said, oh, he's just a little bit overpassionate. Well, the week before, Pepe was a disgrace for putting his head up against someone. So I was a little bit out of order, I thought that was, uh, for those comments. And maybe it's just naivety and inexperience of the manager's part. When I look at what Pepe did after that, he raised his game. He could have done a Matteo Guendouzi, a Mesut Ozil, sulked, mm -hmm. sat on the bench, oh, I don't care about this club, I want to leave, I want to transfer in January. What he did was lift his game, raise his game and said, listen, I'm better than Willian. I don't care what you tell me. I'm better than Martinelli. I'm better than Aubameyang on the left. I can play right or left ahead of Saka. And he was doing it. And I thought, you know what? This is where I've got so much respect for him because he's not a £72 million player and never was, but that's Raul's problem. That's not Pepe's. Yep. He's a 30 to £35 million player. And if he was, everybody would be saying what a great signing he has been. So that's the way I see it with Pepe. I hope he proves and continues to prove the fans wrong because I've been a massive fan of how he's ended, not just this season, but actually ended last season pretty well as well. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of Pepe and I think that we need to need to look at, watch him shine if we can sit fit a system around him. So I just want to lastly loosely go on to the, the Aubameyang and Lacazette situation because Balogun, I think, is going to be a bit part player for us. Eddie and Ketir, I believe, will leave. That leaves us with the situation of do we need another centre forward? Do we stick with a Bamiyang down the centre? Because at times I've been crying out for him down the centre. At times I've been crying out when he's been down the centre to go back on the left. <laughs> and I can't make my yeah. mind up. Um, and with Lacazette, I find that he's had an OK season. But again, is a very frustrating player who misses quite a lot of chances and has done this season, albeit has had a very good um, uh, numbers year. What do you make of the centre forward position, first of all? Do we need another one? Or can we make do with what we've got? This is this is a tough one. And I'm, I'm generally not sure. Um, 
Balogun's good because there's too many unknowns, you know. So Lacazette's the last year of his contract. Do we extend him another year, then sell him next year? If someone knocks the door, for me, he got to sell, right? Abamyang, tough year on and off the pitch, not been the player he should have been for whatever reason. <clears throat> someone says the ink dried on that contract, he stopped running, but I don't think it's as simplistic as that. I just think things went wrong, but I still see a player that's engaged and connected. He's just not going well. Martelli's on the scene. For me, he's a lefty. He's off the left-hand side for me at the moment. That's what he is coming in, second forward, lots of work, right foot crosses, shots, arriving in the box, good secondary movement, good player. Um, so I'm not sure. I think Eddie will go, and, and so he should go. Um, Balogun, it's going to be interesting to see where he is because he's he's got a man's body. He ain't coming to mess about. I, he, he's not coming to mess about. I've watched him a lot of the youth levels. It's hard to judge how good someone is because mm-hmm. there's occasions where he's literally playing against men. or Some occasions he's playing against boys, literally a 17-year-old, and he can do what he likes. That's what happens at that level. You're just not sure. It depends who your opponent is. He needs to play against men next year. If Lacazette stays, Balogun's got to go on loan. The most important thing is that he plays against men so we can see him. He's one of those guys that needs to physically develop and continue because his ability is not just technical, it's physical. When you've got someone like that who's showing man strength, he has to play with men. You know, he has to. Smith Rowe, he's still a young lad. You can see it. He's a young lad playing out of his skin for his age. He needs to be in an Arsenal's environment. He had a bit of time at Huddersfield. But he needs to be in a Premier League environment, a bit more non-contact, a bit more technical. That's where he needs to be. Balogun needs to be out there. So I'm not sure. I'm personally, the decision, I think there's a decision coming, and it all it's all about what offers come to your table. Mm. If an offer came for a Lacazette and a Bamiang, I wonder what the club would do. Mm. I wonder what they would do. You know, um, I'm not sure. I think um, don't be afraid to lose your darlings. You know, a Bamiang I like, but. Again, similar to Shaka, have we seen it? Have we seen everything? Is there anything else to see here? You know, mm-hmm. he can come back to form, get 18 to 20 goals next year, but we've seen the strengths, we've seen the weaknesses. Every now and again, you need to show something different of yourself. And so, yeah, it really to see what happens. I think that one is the one, you know, central defence, right back, centre mid, maybe add one more attacking mid, but we're going to lose one, you know? That's not hard, is it really, Dan? But that centre no. forward one is the one that's really a hostage to events. It could literally happen depending on what offers hit the table, you know. So that's one to watch. I think it's an interesting point you make because it wasn't long ago where I sat there and I said to Tom Canton and Harry, I said, Do you know what? We could actually be in a situation where we lose all of our centre forwards because if Balogun yeah. doesn't sign, if Eddie goes and doesn't sign, if Lacazette doesn't sign, and if Aubameyang, you know, is looking to leave because we haven't got Champions League football, we could be in a situation where it's like, wow, we haven't got no centre forwards. And I thought to myself, is that a bad thing or a good thing? Yeah. It should be a bad thing. But I don't know if it is, because maybe we do need to start again up top. Because I look at the situation and I think I'm a fan of Marcus Turam. I like Edouard from Celtic. Um, I've, I'm not a huge fan of Moussa Dembele, albeit I'm, I'm, you know, I think he's he's OK. He's not really one of the ones I'd go for. A lot of people in the chat talking about what course from uh, Wolfsburg, who I think is a player that you need if you're going to be using a 4-4-2 system. You have like yeah. a little large, not for me like the centre forward guy. But I think there are options up there. We're not going to go and get a Haaland. <laughs> Unfortunately, it'd be nice, but we're not going to go and get a Haaland. So I think it's a really good point that you make. I think it will all be on who's going to sign with the club. Is Eddie going to sign? Is Balogun going to, well, Balogun has signed, but is Aubameyang and Lacazette here for the long-term future? If not, then maybe there's a striker out there that Arsenal could get and maybe be a bit of a shock, Clive. Yep. I mean, I've got some names. Go for it. <laughs> I always do. <laughs> So on Edward, I watch again. I watch Scottish football. Yeah, Sulking of course. All year, he didn't get a move. Sulked all year. Not been the same player. Looked fantastic on YouTube a year or so ago. Not the same player. Watch him play for under twenty ones for France. Not there. Not dynamic enough for me. Um, his price has dropped by ten million. So that tells you everything you need to know. Um, Marcus Turan plays off a left centre forward. Not bad. Mm. Uh, more of a carrier. Got good physicality about him. Not bad. Not sure if he can be quite dynamic enough for the Premier League. 
There's two players that I think if we lost Lacazette and Aubameyang, I would pay the money for. There's one called Alexander Isak, who's sent the forward for Real Sociedad. Mm. Swedish guy. Well, again, he rejected us, went to Real Sociedad. Very quick, very double step over, six foot three, really slim and build, but lightning quick and can carry. Similar in profile to Marcus Rashford, that type of player. Oh, okay. So, um, so yeah, I like him a lot. He moves left and right, runs to sides, can hold it up, turn around, carry it to you. Like him. Going to be a star, in my opinion. And there's one player, and I'm going to get his name wrong, so I'm hoping that your <laughs> listeners will correct me and not abuse me. <laughs> he plays for Fiorentina. His name Vujovic. Vujovic. Um, okay. He's a... He's a, about six foot two, left footed centre forward, like a slightly taller Robin Van Persie, a sharper Giroud. Really is a killer in the box. An absolute killer centre forward. He, for me, I don't care what it costs, that's a player that changes the direction of your club. You know, he's got about wow. 17 to 20 goals in Italy. He is somebody that says he, he's like a slatan in, a, in, the, in personality. He's telling someone's just put, he's it, someone's just put it in the exact the same time as you've done it. Someone's just put it in the uh, chat. Thank you. Oh, oh, Am, oh, Am, yeah, I'm not sure you said Asmaron that. and RG both said it. Yeah, yeah Asmaron. Thank you very much, Asmaron. <laughs> you didn't abuse me as well. I appreciate that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so um, that's the guy. Thank you for getting that right. That's the guy. I wonder what they think. YouTube him. Get out there. Have a look at him. I promise you, Dan, you'll love him when you've seen it. Wow. Wow. They're the two that I would go for if we were to lose our front. Two. Wow. I'm going to have to do that now. A few other names that come to mention, these aren't my my choices or my picks, but we have kind of been, or people have been talking about it. We haven't been heavily linked. Oh, Christ, we're heavily linked with everybody, aren't we? It's that time of year. But um, Lukaku uh, looks to be one that will be potentially off to Inter Milan. Never been a huge fan, but he is a goal scorer. Yeah, um, Luka Jovic. Obviously, at Real Madrid has failed. Obviously, at Frankfurt yeah. was fantastic. Um, not sure. I think that might be a bit of a risk, if I'm honest. And the other one is a Salzburg replacement from uh, Haaland, which is Daka, which would fit in with Laka, Saka and Chaka and get very confusing. But apparently, yeah. he's uh, he's one that's highly rated. So, those are a few names. I don't know if you, what you think of any of those, Clive. Yeah, Daka is a bit like Lacazette, a bit sharper, like a young Lacazette. He's a bit sharp. I, I watched him play against Liverpool, I think it was. Didn't dominate enough for me. He got hooked. Um, not, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, I'm not, fe- who's the other ones mentioned down? Who's the other ones? Uh, Lukaku and Jovic, Luka Jovic. Yeah, Jovic, I really like, but I'm not sure where he is. He went to Real Madrid too soon, lost him, lost himself completely, mm. went back to Frankfurt, scored in his first couple of games, looked amazing immediately. Oh, wow. And then I haven't seen him. I haven't seen, I haven't looked to be honest. I haven't seen him, so I haven't looked. But he's not been flashing up on my timeline, which tells me he's gone a bit quiet. So, um, mm. but I, again, profile-wise, I like him. He's a box killer. So once we fix where we play, and we're now putting the ball into the box a bit more often, well, he's like a closest profile, I would say, probably Sergio Aguero, really, isn't he? A bit like that. Really uh, firing, he fires shots off both feet with real power, good contact. So I quite like him. But Lukaku's underrated. He's underrated. He has moments of weakness in one-on-ones, but he's the sort of player you build around, isn't it? You put him up front and everyone knows what you're going to do or how you're going to do it. And he is a totem pole centre forward that literally can bully people and ragdoll people all around. I like him. He's He lost a few kgs while he's been in Italy. Conti's really looked after him. And um, Conti's my favourite manager, by the way. <laughs> so he's happened to be available. <laughs> yep. So, um, yep. So uh, he's the sort of manager I think the club needs. He's going to absolutely bully our board into activity. And then he was the manager I would have chosen after Wenger. But actually, I think the project manager, which, which we have right now, is um, probably what we need right now. So Conti should have come when Wenger left. A completely different person, rather than somebody who come along who was part of the new regime, the new structure that was bought in and was happy to be here. So was wasn't going to bully the club into action. You know, so need somebody who wasn't going to accept what we've always given our managers in recent years. So, so yeah, so he's really done wonders for Lukaku and I've seen pictures of him recently and he looks really sharp. I wonder where he's going to go. 
can he can end up mm. back at Chelsea. He can end up back at Chelsea. So watch this I think that's probably where he is going to go, if I'm honest. I, mm. I can see that happening. I'm totally with you on Antonio Conte. When Wenger left, I wanted uh, Diego Simeone. Um, because they wanted that type who would come in and 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 not be bullied. Uh, Antonio Conte is right up there on my on my wish list, uh, along with Allegri. Um, and most of them are available at the moment. Uh, obviously, we've got Conte available. We've got Rafa Benitez available. I've always rated. We've got Allegri available. I've always liked. They're all winners. I think Allegri's and- just is he joined. Juventus? Joining Juventus, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Juventus, so, yeah. And maybe Conte will be off to Real Madrid. I don't know. Let's That's see what rumor. happens. But That's the rumor. That is the rumor. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, before I let you go, Clive, I just want to get a bit of an understanding on, of, from yourself. Who's been your player of the season, first of all? Uh, well, Saka's a player sorry. of the season. Yeah, Saka's a player of the season. There's no debate. And I know he's been a little bit leggy recently, but just think back to those dark, dark months of winter. And there was one shining light. There was only one. And um, he was doing it when everyone else who are experienced or highly paid were nowhere. They were literally running away from the ball, hiding in passing lanes. There was one player carrying us. And do not forget that. There were some dark moments there, Dan. And I think... I know I, I love Pepe like you, and I'm, you know I've got high hopes for that core of players that we can all name. We all know that mm-hmm. core is the Untouchables. We all know that core, and um, which tells you what the year's been about, isn't it? It's been about development of that core. We've now bought a couple, and we others have developed into absolutely untouchable players. So we have a core from which to build on, and Saka is part of that. Hundred percent. I could not agree more. Um, your favourite goal of the season? I'm going to ask. Um, I'm going to give you mine first. Mine was actually. I think my favourite team goal was actually at West Brom, uh, which was the the Lacazette triangle passing with Smith Rowe and Saka. I thought yeah. that was an outstanding move. I absolutely loved that. But my actual favourite goal of the season came in that game uh, because he's my favourite player who scored it. And uh, I always yeah. look at memories of pictures of 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 kind of where. I would have a picture of a player that's just scored. And Kieran Tierney in the snow, going mental with his passion, with a great bit of individual quality, a right foot shot into the into the top corner for me against West Brom was my goal of the season. Uh, so, Clive, I'll put the question to you. What was your favourite goal? I've just done this on the Arsenal Vision, actually. And I, oh, sorry, uh, mate. <laughs> no, wait, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not to say sorry. I just like Pepe goals. I just okay. like Pepe goals. I think his double nutmeg at Wolves was unbelievable right foot into the corner. I love the one at West Brom. I love the one, I love, how many of them? How many long shots have we had? How Alice, many? That was a good one the other week. Alice Alice was the great. Other week. I just think he scores goals, which are just the sort of thing when you're in the ground, Dan, you know, you know what it's like. You're in the ground and he's the sort of guy that you walk into the pub, you're talking about. It's, it's as simple as that, you know, because he does things that you could never dream of doing. You know, and I just think, the way he plays in the box is just unique. And so, yeah, I like the, the Wolves goal in particular. It's my favourite. Excellent. No, I like it. Uh, and just lastly, your favourite game of the season, Clive? Yeah, I I sort of, you know what? The game I, I choose is the West Ham away one, right? So there were, oh, okay. there, were two, there were two games, really. So West Ham away, because it almost epitomises us. There were moments of absolute stupidity. There was just like, oh my God, we're three all down at West Ham. What's going on? You know, what is going on? And then we woke up and played some of the best football I've seen for years. It was just wonderful, you know? So I enjoyed that one. And I enjoyed Slavia away. Mm. I thought um, the whole thing around that game, the what Lacazette did before that game, Against the standing up against racism, I thought was brilliant. The way we approached that game in the first half was top top. We went for them, and that's all I want to see in the, in the team. I'm not too worried about results per se because if you get the process right and you start to see things that which look right, results will come. And I thought the approach to that game was absolutely excellent. So much courage. Unlike the Villarreal home game, <laughs> do you know what I mean? That was only like, a, and that, that's what's so crazy about football. Who'd have thought we'd have just mm. just fallen away mentally in that game? You know, three weeks later, you know. So, um, so yeah, that Slavia game, I was very proud to be an Arsenal fan that day. 
fair play. Um, I think for me, it was quite simple. It was the North London derby at the Emirates. I think that because the way they scored that outrageous goal from Lamella for him to then get sent off for us to turn it around uh, was superb. And I saw some outstanding individual performances that day from Erdegaard and Smith Rowe, which really kind of excited me. You know, it was outstanding. So that for me was the easy one. Um, Clive, final question before I let you go. Um, Where should we be realistically looking next season in the league. It's all we've got to play for. As you say, no excuses. Domestic Cups, of course, would be nice. But looking at the league table, where do you think realistically we should be aiming for? So I was one of those people that didn't want to qualify for Europe this year. I said Fair play, same ago, here. I said I didn't want... Obviously, Champions League is different. Same but I didn't here. want to be in the Europa League. I don't know. When I found out about Europa Conference, we're actually winning on Sunday. I'm thinking, oh my God, where are we going to end up? Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't want to be in that neither. I think the embarrassment would have been too much for me. Too much. Same here. Same here. So I, I really want us to focus on the league because I think we need to reset. We need to reset as a club. So what's happened with contract wise the players need to go? We're doing exactly what I hope would happen, which is renew the players, focus on the league. Reset the expectations of Arsenal Football Club by playing league games like their cup finals every single week and have a better season than, than what West Ham have just had. Do you know what I mean? They've had mm. that season where they can focus on the league and they've ended up only a few points ahead of us. We can do this way. We need to find 15, 20 points. We're not going to do that being in multiple European competitions, if you know what I mean. We're not going to do it. I think we lost eight games after Thursday night, something like that. It's not going to happen. So let's not... Let's stop dreaming. It's not going to happen. We need to focus on one competition and really focus on it. Again, no excuses. We've got a good coach as a manager. We can debate his man management skills and people will do that. And that is their right. If we have a good coach, then start coaching. Let's start preparing for these games, these league games. And let's try and get those 15, 20 points. So I will always, I thought we might finish in the top six last year. Didn't quite happen. I'm looking at top four this year. And it has to be. It has to be. A, or it's got to be a really near miss. Do you know what I mean? Like we tripped mm. over tripped over on the try line. Literally, it's got to be one of them. That's the only thing I'm going to accept because... But it all depends on the summer. If we don't do what we meant to do, then our expectations will be set for us, won't they? If we do what we hope to do, and what the, the transfer rumors are telling us we might do, it could be quite interesting. It could mm. be quite interesting. So we will know by August, mate. We will know a lot more. But I want... Right now, if we do what we think we're going to do, we've got to be aiming for top four. We have to be. We know we really do. There's no excuses for me. That's what we've got to go for. 100% agree with you, mate. And it is a lot of people in the chat saying it all depends what we do in the summer. Absolutely spot on it does. But if yeah. we're rumoured to believe who we're going to be linked with, we need to be going for the top four, which, by the way, is going to be very difficult. Um, if Harry Kane does go to Manchester City, I think everybody else can forget the league for the next four seasons. Um, Liverpool are going to be back because of their player and their injuries coming back. I think Manchester United are going to improve their squad. And, of course, Chelsea are going to spend a lot of money. And if they get a Lukaku signing and some others, I think under Thomas Tuchel, they've proved that they can start to win some games. So I think that's your top four. We need to be as close to that as possible, in my opinion. I don't believe we've got that with this manager. I'm not a huge fan of him, Clive, and I have been quite openly okay. honest about that. Um, and I don't feel that whoever we bring in, uh, he's got the, the the need to us to, to get to push us forward and progress. So I would love to see a Conte. I would love to see an Allegri or a Rafa come in, but I don't think it's realistic. I think the owners are, make, are here to stay, unfortunately, which means that Arteta is here to stay. So I think that we have to be realistic about who we bring in, but a top four push has got to be there. And I fear for his job um, if we get to November and things aren't looking too rosy. So that's my opinion of it. Um, Clive, You've been an absolute star, man. It's gone so quickly. Um, over 90 minutes of chatting to you has been an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Uh, it really has. Uh, I could talk to you all night, mate. But thank you so much for coming on, first of all, mate. No, it's a long time. You've, you've asked for a long time. So apologies it took so long and I, and I really enjoyed it. And um, I can see some of the chats and um, and I appreciate that. They've all been uh, quite patient with me. <laughs> and so, uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you very much for asking me. No, listen, it's been a pleasure having you on. I've always want, always been a fan and always wanted to get you on to talk some Arsenal. So I do appreciate you coming on. Thank you to everyone in the chat as well. There was almost 400 of you watching live at one stage. So thank you so much for listening to myself and Clive go on. Uh, it's going to be a strange time now. We're going to have a bit of a break, to be honest, the same old Arsenal podcast. Uh, but we will be back 
uh, when the Arsenal do start to kick off. I'm sure we'll do some transfer rumours throughout, um, but we're going to try and have a bit of a break and enjoy the Euros, which is upcoming. So myself, Craig Lee, Judges, Harry Simu uh, and Graham Brooks will be back with Mark Partridge for you when the season starts up again. Uh, my thanks to Clive and everyone in the chat. Up the Arsenal. and We'll see you next season. <laughs>